Well, good day, everybody. It is August 30th, and we begin today the book of Ezekiel, chapters 1 through 4. And as I always do, as we when we be begin a new book, let me read, from, uh, read to you from the uh, Wesley Study Bible, uh, the introduction to Ezekiel. <clears throat> the book of Ezekiel has challenged readers from the beginning. Early rabbinic tradition cautioned, cautioned against premature exposure to Ezekiel's daring presentation of the glory of the Lord in chapter 1. Ezekiel's marital uh, allegories in chapters 16 and 23 shock and offend some readers. Even so, the book's canonical status has been secure since well before the time of Jesus, and its contribution to the Christian faith is significant. The book is uniquely autobiographical. Even so, focus remains on the Lord's word. Fourteen chronological references keyed to the deportation of the Judean king Jehoiakim in 597 BC historically situate the Lord's visual and verbal address to the prophet. These references give the book a general chronological flow and indicate an interest in having certain materials read against the backdrop of historical realities. Nevertheless, the book's theological flow outweighs its chronological ordering. At the beginning, readers enter the remarkable vision, the dramatic call, and the prophetic commission of the exiled priest. The book then repeatedly links the fall of Jerusalem to the past and present sins of God's people countering moves to evade responsibility for the tragedy. The book invests prophetic capital garnered by Ezekiel's accurate anticipation of the fall of Jerusalem in proclaiming the Lord's sovereign governance of the nations in judgment and blessing. Against this international backdrop, the book details Israel's restoration centered in a new temple, a refined priesthood and prince and an idyllic restored land. Theologically, the book moves from the startling departure of the glory of the Lord from the temple and then from Jerusalem itself through its journey toward the exiles in the east and its eventual return to the restored temple in the city climatically named the Lord is there. All right, that's the introduction. So Ezekiel is uh, uh, divided into three major sections. Section one, uh, which begins with chapter one and goes through chapter 24, is about God's judgment of the covenant people and the departure of the divine presence. The second, second section, chapter 25 through chapter 32, is God's judgment of the nations. And then chapter 33 through the end of the book is God's transformation of the covenant people and the return of the divine presence. All right. Let's get into the text. So uh, what we uh, begin with uh, chapter one is the visions of God at Shabar Canal. Ezekiel's inaugur inaugural vision is vital for the understanding of the theology of the book as a whole. The vision itself is stunning. There is nothing like it elsewhere in the Old Testament. It overpowers the prophet at the moment of the vision and the description has continued to overwhelm believers who have received it for many, many, many centuries. The elements of the vision just sort of spill to us out of the page with the prophet consistently resorting to analogical language. Analogical language is the language of light, something like. Uh, and this language is used to convey what uh, the prophet sees, cloud, fire, amber, living creatures, Wings, legs, bronze, uh, hands, faces, lions, eagles, ox, burning coals, torch, lightnings, wheels, rims, eye, spirit, dome, deafening sound, throne, sapphire, human form, amber, fire, and splendor. I hope I got it all there. I might have missed something. Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel can only give an approximate description of God's glory. The vision is both orderly and chaotic, and it does not cohere in one depiction of what is seen. Ezekiel experiences a tremendous mystery. The Latin is mysterium tremendum. So, you know, any, any doctrine that's worth its salt has a Latin phrase, okay? So a mysterium tremendum, um, 
great, tremendous mystery. And he experiences this of God's presence and what he sees and hears. Yet God is also not fully present in the vision. In this massive sensory overload that Ezekiel experienced, the prophet glimpses God, and yet that glimpse also points away from God. It simultaneously reveals and obscures. Ezekiel 128 sums up the vision. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. The paradox at the heart of this vision uh, is also one of the central paradoxes and main theological claims of the book. That is the simultaneous presence and absence of God. It is 593 BC, five years after the first wave of deportations from Judah into Babylon and Ezekiel and the other exiles have been in Babylon now for about five years. The prophet is by an irrigation canal in Babylon when the heavens are opened and he has a vision of the divine realm that exists above the earthly realm. Many modern readers now assume God can be present anywhere, but for Ezekiel and his audience, the presence of God is closely tied to a particular place, the temple in Jerusalem. For them, the possibility of a destroyed Jerusalem temple and their exile to Babylon seem to signal the unthinkable, namely the defeat of their God, the defeat of Yahweh and the triumph of the Babylonian gods. To encounter uh, God anywhere outside of the Jerusalem temple would be not only unprecedented, but difficult for the exiles to imagine. Thus, Ezekiel's vision makes a powerful and astounding theological claim. Yahweh has not abandoned the exiles to foreign gods and is not bound by spatial limitations, as appearances suggest. On the contrary, and extraordinarily, Israel's God is present with the exiles in the backwaters of Babylon itself. The vision itself thus serves as comfort to the exiles that they have not been abandoned, but God's continuing presence also bears ominous overtones. It means that God will not allow the people to forgo an accounting of their failures that have brought them to this point. I think it's important to, to note here is that one of the great tensions in Israel's theology has been they serve a God who is the God of all gods, and there is no God. In fact, there is only one God. He is, he does, he, God has no rivals. All the idols, all the other false gods are non-existent. And yet at the same time, God's presence is located particularly in Jerusalem and in the temple. And so there is this tension between the God of the universal in Israel's theology and the God of the particular. And so what happens in exile is that God begins to communicate that God is the particular in that he has called Israel, but precisely in the calling of Israel, he wants to be the universal God that brings the message to all people. The long and short of it is, is that it's an exile when the people of God realize, hey, Yahweh is the God of the Babylonians too, and God is here. This is really important, and it will be highlighted, by the way, when we get to Jesus and the Gospels. All right, chapter two. I'm talking a long time today. I'm sorry. Here we get in chapter two, the prophet's call. As in other prophetic books, Ezekiel offers a narrative of his call by God to the prophetic task. Ezekiel's response to the vision in chapter one had been to fall down and worship, and it is from that posture that he is lifted by the Spirit of God and set upon his feet to hear the divine commission. And so we get a new, uh, new theme introduced here, the sinfulness of Israel as the primary problem that God seeks to address through the work of this exiled prophet. So uh, the Babylonians bear responsibility for their acts of conquest and dragging the exiles of the people of Israel off, but the primary problem is God's people and their sin. Ezekiel literally eats the grim prophet's word he is to proclaim here, uh, an entirely fitting beginning to the prophetic activity since much of what he will convey to the Israelites throughout the book is symbolically enacted in his own body. He will literally embody as a prophet God's word to Israel. In some ways, he points toward the beginnings 
of an incarnational theology that is the God in human form that will come to us fully and decisively in Jesus Christ. God commands Ezekiel to engage in three sign actions, uh, to withdraw to his house, to be bound with cords there, and to remain speechless except to deliver the word that God chooses. Ezekiel's uh, lack of, of speech has long puzzled uh, certain commentators since so much of the book is filled with his own speech. But the point here, I think, is that Ezekiel is not to fulfill the traditional prophetic role of trying to bring the people to repentance for their sins. Yes, of course, the people are accountable for their state to which Israel has descended. But paradoxically, the prophet's task here is not to make them shape up or they're incapable of responsible action on their own. The prophet is only to offer to the people an account of the gravity of their situation and of how God will act to deliver them from it. We get to chapter four. Ezekiel here continues to bear the word of the Lord on his body in a series of sign actions that we see in chapter four and chapter five. Um, we have uh, the brick diorama, the prophet's lying on his side for 430 days and shaving of his hair. Uh, we'll get to that in chapter five, but all of these enact the final siege and fall of Jerusalem that will take place between 589 and 587. The mixed grain bread that's cooked over dung and eaten with a small ration of water symbolized the deprivations of life under the siege. Israel has broken its covenant with God, mainly because of idolatrous worship, but also by breaking the law, breaking the commandments, and they will live out the consequences of that brokenness, the fear and wasting that characterizes life under siege, closely mirrors the curses imposed for breaking the covenant. And for that, we go back to Leviticus 26. All right. That's where we are today. Tomorrow, chapters five through eight, let's pray. Gracious God, you have gifted us with so many blessings in this day, and we are thankful. And as always, as we receive these blessings, may we bless others in return. May we point to you and your ways. May, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, may others see our good works and glorify you. Glorify your Father in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Hey. See you tomorrow.